to introduce our Innovation Grand Rounds uh, speaker today, uh, Professor uh, um, Nicholas Wu here. And Nick uh, is uh, a professor in uh, jointly between our Department of Biochemistry in LAS and in our Department of Biomedical and Translational Sciences in Carl Illinois uh, College of Medicine. He, uh, he received his bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and then went on to the University of California, LA, Los Angeles for his doctorate degree and then postdoc training at Scripps. Uh, he's done phenomenal work uh, already and has made really impactful uh, studies that were, uh, that were published in top journals like Science and Nature Communications and, and many others. And all of them are in this area of looking at the interactions, molecular interactions between antibodies and viral antigens. He's, uh, he's received the NIH Pathway to Independence Award and uh, we just found out, and uh, I think it was a week ago or so, that he was named uh, and to receive one of the NIH Director's New Innovator Award, uh, one of among only 64 uh, new faculty that received that this year. So truly, it's a pleasure. Uh, we, we look forward to hearing from innovators in this space, and uh, we can think of no one better than you, Nick, to, to really talk and tell us about this influenza evolution, something that's Clear, clearly timely and of interest to all of us. So please join me in welcoming Professor Wu. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, today I'm gonna talk about how um, uh, 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 influenza virus evolution challenges the development of an effective uh, um, uh, vaccine. Um, so before I start talking about uh, influenza evolution and, and vaccine, I would like to um, give a brief introduction of um, the influenza virus. So there are four types of influenza viruses, um, A to D, so type A, B, C, D. Um, influenza A virus is, is uh, further divided into subtypes. Um, so H something, N something, H1, N1, X3, N2. Um, those are all um, influenza A virus. And on the bottom right um, here, um, it, is a, it is the best um, model of influenza virus particle that, uh, that I can find online. Uh, this, is, this was downloaded from the CDC. Um, so the, the, the surface of the virus are, are decorated um, with um, uh, uh, different proteins. Um, and uh, two of the surface proteins, hemoglobinin and neuraminidase, are um, the, most, uh, free, uh, the, the, the most common proteins on the um, uh, virus surface. So the, the uh, um, influenza D virus does not really infect human, and influenza C virus um, does not cause severe disease, um, they usually receive less attention. So people only care about influenza A and B. Um, and currently, uh, H1N1 and X3N2 of influenza A virus, along with influenza B virus, are circulating in the human population. And according to WHO, um, they cause around three to five million severe illness and a couple hundred thousand, thousand deaths annually. Um, most research has been focusing on influenza A virus because it is thought to cause a more severe uh, illness than influenza B virus. And unlike influenza B virus, which almost exclusively found in human, influenza A virus can cause a pandemic. Okay, so um, HA, hemagglutinin, um, which is the most abundant protein on the virus survey. So you can see like the entire virus surface is full of this um, uh, HA protein. Um, it's the major target for the antibodies. So um, uh, the development of influenza vaccine mainly focuses on targeting the HA protein. Yeah, so basically if we get infected by influenza virus, uh, most of our antibodies um, generated would be targeting this HA protein. Um, and here's the structure of um, the HA, inter-influence HA. Um, in influence HA is divided into the head domain um, on top and the uh, stem domain in the bottom. And the antibody response to the HA mainly targets five major antigenic sites, A to E. So people, people divided um, the, uh, the, the, the sites that antibody target into five different sites um, based, on the, based on the spatial arrangement. Um, and in other words, if we get infected by influenza virus or get vaccinated, um, most of our antibodies will target those five major sites. So those five colored sites on the on, on this structure. Um, and those sites are all located in head domain. 
Um, so the natural function of uh, HA is essential for viral entry. Um, the head domain is responsible for binding to the host receptor, uh, and the receptor um, for influenza virus is sialylytic glycan. Um, so the HA will engage the glycan, which is represented by these yellow sticks here, um, as the first step of virus infection. Whereas the stem domain and codes um, uh, some conserved element, um, some conserved residues, uh, which are responsible for uh, fusion. So this part of, of the HA, the stem part, is important for facilitating the membrane fusion between virus and host to facilitate virus entry. Uh, so this is just a, a schematic um, diagram to show, uh, um, sh to briefly show uh, um, the process of viral entry of influenza virus. So, um, so this rectangular shape is a, is a, is a whole cell and this is the virus particle. So when the virus particle first engages the whole cells, it will engage um, the glycan, which is represented by this uh, um, red and orange uh, shape uh, um, here, the, the polygon here. Um, so the HA will bind to the um, uh, glycan, and then endocytosis will occur. So the, the virus particle will be, uptake, will be uptaken by the cell. Um, and, then, and then when it reaches the endosome, where the pH reach uh, around five, um, um, the proton, the acidic environment will um, trigger a rearrangement of HA. So uh, showing in this uh, middle box here, the middle panel here, um, the HA is binding to the whole cells and the low pH will trigger the a rearrangement. Um, so moving to, to the right, such that um, the, host, the, 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 the membrane of the virus and the whole cells will be fused. And then subsequently, all the genetic material in the virus will be released into the uh, host cells for um, uh, subsequent replication. So the virus can start replicating in the host cells. Um, so the, the virus evolved a lot due to immune pressure, um, uh, just like uh, what, COVID is, what COVID is doing right now. Um, the virus is keep, keeps evolving, keep accumulating mutations over time. Um, so I'm, sh I'm showing you here, um, the evolution of HA of X3 and two subtypes. Um, so this graph is showing the mutation accumulation of HA in X3 and two subtype um, starting from 1968. So since, so X3 and two subtype um, of influenza A virus enters human population in 1968. So in 1968, X3 and two a pandemic, um, which is also known as Hong Kong flu. Um, it is originated in Hong Kong. Um, and then since then, it keeps circulating in the human population for um, almost uh, uh, for over 70, over 70 years, uh, over, uh, over uh, uh, 50 years. Um, and uh, um, close to 80 mutations have been accumulated in the HA protein. So considering that the HA protein is, uh, is only um, five, around 500 amino acids, so 80 mutation is actually quite a lot. Um, it's, it's accounting for uh, close to 20% of the protein. So over the course of evolution of the seasonal virus in the, in the past 50 years, so for this particular extreme two subtypes, 20% of the protein that is targeted by antibodies um, have evolved, have, have been mutated. And many of these mutations, many of these 80 mutations uh, play a role in uh, escaping the antibody response. Um, the other thing that, uh, uh, um, that is quite significant uh, in, in terms of the virus evolution is the accumulation, is the accumulation of our glycolization site. Um, so over the, the, the past uh, 50 years, um, the amount of glycolization on HA of X3 and 2 virus uh, uh, have been increasing. So, so since um, influence of H3 and 2 virus entered the human population in 1968, up to six glycosation sites have been added to this to, to its HA. So, I'm, so here I'm showing you a structure uh, uh, um, uh, view um, of uh, the glycosation. So as you can see here, um, this is 1968. Um, this, this is the name of the string. In 1968, um, when, the, when the virus first entered the human population, um, there are a few glycosation sites. Um, but then um, after around... 45 years or 50 years of evolution, we see a lot more glycosation, which is represented by these cyan colored uh, sticks. 
Um, and those scar coalition um, help blocking the antibody from binding to the um, uh, HA protein. So um, it will, I mean, when, when, it, when, it, when it can, when it um, uh, prevent antibody binding, um, it helps uh, escaping the antibody response in the human population. So th those glycans also play an important role um, in the in the in the in escaping um, vaccine or uh, pre-existing immunity. So yeah, due to all this evolution uh, of the virus, the vaccine has to um, be updated uh, quite frequently. So over the course of the past twenty years, the vaccine has the the, the vaccine component of X three N two virus um, uh, has been updated twelve times. So uh, the vaccine has to the vac the, the the frequency of updating the vaccine um, is more than uh, is more than once per uh, two years, so it's it's quite frequent. And um, so here I'm only showing you um, H three N two virus, uh, but uh, the same similar things can be uh, observed in H one N one and influenza B, which is which are the other two uh, subtypes that are circulating in the human population. So being able to keep up with the natural evolution of influenza virus is a is a very well known challenge in uh, influenza vaccine development. Because the vaccine, the, the, when we develop vaccine, um, our antibody, we, our body will generate some antibody response uh, if we get vaccinated, and then um, the, the the virus will evolve to escape the uh, immunity, and then we have to update the vaccine again. I mean, this is this is like an arms race, and uh, this is a very well known problem. Um, but today, I'm not actually not I, actually I'm not going to focus on this uh, this this uh, arms race, like how we actually update the, uh, the influenza vaccine. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is understanding why the effectiveness of uh, seasonal influenza vaccine is so low. So as you can see in this graph here, um, those are the vaccine effect effectiveness uh, for seasonal vaccine in the past um, uh, 15 years or so. Um, so on top here, this is 70%. So in the past 15 years, everything has been below 70%. Okay, In some years that, that, are, uh, uh, that are like really bad, it's like 15% effectiveness. Uh, so this is basically um, not really doing much, right? Uh, uh, like out of 10 people that got the vaccine, only 1.5 of them um, have some, actually, is actually getting some protection. So this is really bad. Um, <clears throat> some of these years uh, where we get like really low effectiveness is due to uh, the vaccine mismatch uh, because the virus is evolving so fast. So the vaccine that is being produced does not really look like what is actually circulating that year. Uh, but even though, uh, um, but even in some of the years where the vaccine um, looks uh, like the uh, circulating strain, where they actually do a really good prediction and predict what is uh, upcoming and they make a vaccine that, match, that matches uh, what is actually ongoing in the circulating strain, um, the vaccine effectiveness is still like really low, like 61% for H1N1, flu B, 54%. And especially bad for uh, X3 and 2, 33%. Um, I mean, if, when you talk about like COVID vaccine, right, COVID 19 vaccine, um, we're talking about like 90 something percent, or even like when we talk about the Delta variant, it's still like 70, 80%. It's like better than seasonal vaccine. So the problem is like, why? Uh, the question is why um, uh, 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 seasonal influenza vaccine is like so bad? Um, to understand this problem, uh, we can actually look at, uh, we, we should look at uh, how uh, the vaccines are being produced. So, so um, this is uh, 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 the market share of uh, in influenza vaccine um, in, uh, I believe, uh, 2014, or, I, I, no, I believe uh, 2018. Um, so in 2018, 94% of the seasonal vaccine are actually produced in eggs. 3% are, are produced um, uh, as recombinant protein, and 3% are cell-grown uh, uh, virus. But majority of them are actually um, viruses that are grown in eggs and are being inactivated. So growing in flu in eggs actually lead to egg adaptation. Um, so flu actually evolve when they are being produced as a vaccine in eggs. And this actually is a major problem in uh, influenza vaccine. And I'm gonna spend um, um, the next half of my talk on this issue. So, this, so I'm, I'm just trying to show you uh, uh, the, the process of uh, producing uh, influenza virus uh, in, in eggs. Um, so what people do for eggs for uh, uh, making influence, a seasonal influenza virus is that first they have to isolate some uh, um, virus uh, in human. Okay, so after they isolate in human, uh, uh, some virus in human, um, they have to predict like which strain 
um, it's gonna up, uh, it's gonna it's gonna come up in that in 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 the flu season for the particular year. So they usually do this process around uh, 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 six months before the uh, six to eight months before the actual flu season starts. Um, so they they isolate the, the the so let's say in the U.S. right the flu season is in the winter. So they do this uh, flu isolation process um, during um, January February to prepare for this flu season in October November, um, and then after they do some prediction, they said okay so this flu strain is most likely to come up in the in the upcoming flu season six to eight months later. They will inoculate the, the, the flu virus in the eggs. So they will keep growing the flu virus in the eggs um, to scale up, uh, 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 to basically just do a large scale production. The problem is that um, the flu virus will mutate in eggs. And why does this uh, uh, happen? So I'm, 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 just showing, I'm just showing you the HA in, in this, like, uh, 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 like a, a spike on the, on, the, on the virus and uh, uh, different color representing um, the, the, the HA is uh, uh, mutating. Okay, so I, I got a question here. I, I probably want to address that a little bit. Um, so um, the question is, uh, um, at what time point in the flu season is, a, is the vaccine, if, vaccine effectiveness known? Um, are there any way to intervene, intervene during the season? Um, yeah, so uh, um, people can estimate the vac vaccine effectiveness like quite early on in the flu season. Um, but the problem is that, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's quite hard to change the, um, the C string, to, to, to change the, vac vaccine, the, the vaccine string because uh, uh, you have to reserve a couple months for like vaccine production and then all the transportation, all the quality, quality uh, 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 control. So uh, it's actually quite hard to change something in the middle of the season. Um, yeah, so basically we are committed to this vaccine simply based on the prediction, like around six months before uh, uh, the actual uh, flu season starts. Okay, uh, so let's get back to the uh, egg adaptation issue. Um, again, HA binds to the receptor to facilitate virus entry. And the, and the receptor for the virus looks different in um, human or in avian, so eggs. The chicken eggs, right? The avian. Um, uh, so the receptor is like avian type. This is how it looks for the receptor in human, and this is how it looks for the uh, receptor in uh, uh, any avian cells, in, including uh, uh, chicken eggs. Um, uh, I mean, you, 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 I mean, you probably don't need a lot of chemistry knowledge to tell they are actually different. They look different. Um, I mean, this part is conserved, right? But the rest uh, 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 are different. Um, the problem is that of, uh, uh, of, of um, uh, the difference in receptor is that the receptor binding site actually overlaps with um, three of the major antigenic sites, A, B, and D, so blue, red, and orange. So receptor binding site partially overlaps with um, uh, uh, um, the major antigenic sites, which is where the uh, antibody uh, binds. Um, and this is something that, and, and, and during the, uh, um, and during the uh, egg adaptation process, so when the virus grow in eggs, um, uh, one problem is that uh, the virus has to mutate its receptor binding site in order to accommodate the um, avian type receptor. So that would, so this receptor binding site would change, right? Um, and when the, when the receptor binding site is changed, it would affect how the antigenic sites. Uh, look, so it, it will affect um, uh, antigenic site A, B, or D, um, depends on, depending on uh, where the mutation is. So now, uh, this is something that we don't we, we don't want to see. We don't want the immune system to uh, 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 to see the difference between the vaccine and the circulating strain, right? Uh, for example, some antibody may, may bind to the vaccine strain and may, it will not be able to bind to the circulating strain, and some antibody may bind, be able to bind to the circulating strain but not the vaccine strain. I mean, this is not something we want. Um, so, uh, so this kind of difference, um, we call it the change in antigenicity. So antigenicity basically representing um, how the immune system is seeing the virus. So if they have different, if the, if the two virus, if the vaccine and the circulating strain have different uh, antigenicity, that means the immune system is seeing, that, is seeing them differently. So the immune system can, can tell them they are different. And then um, the antibody response generating against the circulating strain or the vaccine strain would not be able to uh, effectively uh, 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 bind to uh, uh, the counterpart. So this is this is going to be bad, bad vaccine. Okay, so um, our study focusing on uh, uh, one of the adaptation, try to uh, and, and try to uh, uh, demonstrate uh, 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 
the issue of adaptation. So this mutation um, is, uh, is called L194P. It's changing from leucine to proline at the residue 194. And this is part of the research binding site. So L194 rapidly emerges during um, egg passaging. So when, we, when you grow the virus, when you grow the X, X3 and 2 virus in eggs, so we, we call it egg passaging, when you, when you passage the virus in eggs, um, this mutation pop up like really quickly. Um, and uh, uh, um, we can look at the database, and this is what we do. We, we look at the sequence database, and we found that um, uh, uh, when the virus is grown in eggs, um, this L194P mutation is very common, represented by the blue color. Uh, when, and, if, and if the virus is being sequenced without passaging in eggs, so people just, uh, uh, so some uh, clinicians just um, um, uh, isolate the virus from the human without putting them in eggs and just sequence them directly, uh, we never see that mutation, okay? And this mutation locates in the reserve line site. So this part is the reserve line site. Um, the, green, the, green is, uh, uh, the green color is the backbone of the uh, reserve line site. And we can see that um, L194 is located by like, pointing towards the reserve line site. Um, so we did an experiment where we draw um, the serum from um, uh, people vaccinated by the seasonal vaccine. And in this time, um, the seed stock contain uh, L194. So we ensure every individual get the vac get get the virus, um, get the vaccine, uh, where the HA contains L194 without the uh, egg adaptive mutations, and then we draw the serum and then we test the binding um, to uh, 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 the HA that carries the L194, which is which is matching uh, what is uh, what is being uh, what is it, what is included in the vaccine, or the P194, which is the egg adaptive muta egg adaptive mutation, and then we can see that um, the serum binding drops a lot which means the immune system is able to tell the difference between L194 and P194. Um, and then we also test um, uh, the binding of a monoclonal antibody. So this antibody called CO5, it binds to the uh, receptor binding site. Uh, it is actually one of the like really good antibody uh, that people isolate. Um, it binds really well um, to uh, um, um, the parental strain, so the L194 version, but it doesn't really bind um, to the egg adaptive mutation the egg adaptive mutant, it doesn't really bind that well. Um, so again, this is, also, this is also demonstrating this L194P is changing the antigenicity of the virus. Um, so, and then we perform a structural analysis trying to figure out like what exactly happened. Um, so when we solve the structure, uh, we don't see much difference between the backbone um, of the P194 and L194 uh, version of the, uh, of the HA. Um, so the, you see the backbone is aligning really well, um, but uh, when we look at the electro, ele electron density, so we're, we're getting some, uh, we're getting a little bit technical here. So electron density is basically um, showing you uh, uh, the, like how confident you are in calling the, in, 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 in modeling the structure. Um, so if the, if the electron density is stronger, something, so something like this, we are seeing, actually seeing the density, that means we are really confident that the, there's, uh, there are like protein, uh, there are like amino acids uh, over there, there are like atoms over there. And we are showing uh, different sigma, la sigma level, which is uh, showing different contour level or cutoff point in the intensity of the electro density. So in the L184, which is the non-adaptive version, um, uh, so this is the, the 190 helix, which is where the uh, L194 locates, uh, we can see that the density is actually quite strong, even, that, even though we increase the contour level to 2.0 uh, sigma, which is like a very stringent cutoff, we can see a strong density. That means we're quite confident that the structure is like, is there. But when we look at our P194, which is the adaptive mutant, um, the density is like lost uh, when we in increase the contour, uh, when we increase the uh, 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 sigma level on the contour level. Um, so at two sigma, we actually don't see any uh, electron density. Um, and we, even we decrease to 1.6, uh, we only see like some. Um, 1.2 uh, is, the, is uh, we, we actually start recovering some uh, electron density, but it's, a lot more weak, uh, a lot weaker than um, uh, the L194. That means the mutation is, is actually increasing the structural flexibility. flexibility. Um, and this mutant, um, uh, uh, the, the flexibility of this uh, mutant can be represented by something called B factor. Um, so this B value is a, is a way to uh, represent the, the structural flexibility, uh, uh, is a way to quantifying the structural flexibility. Um, and then we can see that um, it's a lot more red in the egg adaptive, egg adaptive mutant. 
that, uh, and then uh, based on the heat map, uh, red represents a uh, high B value, which represents uh, um, high structural flexibility. So that means that the, uh, um, the, the egg adaptive mutation is actually just like making the receptor binding site, especially the top part, like really flexible. Um, and uh, uh, um, we believe that that would uh, uh, prevent antibody from binding um, to uh, that part of the protein. Um, so yeah, this is just a, a way to like uh, quantifying uh, the B value along uh, the protein. And we can see that uh, the, red, the green line, which represent the L194 and the blue line, which represent the P1, P1194, um, has a huge gap at this region, which correspond to the, uh, um, this helix right here at the top of the, uh, of the receptor binding site. Okay, um, so we now we plot, uh, we just, we're just showing, we just uh, 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 show the flexibility in a different way uh, by using the difference in B value. Um, so purple represents um, the change in B value uh, at the higher magnitude. Um, so um, again, this is a reserve binding site and in the front view and then in top view, this is, this is actually the antigenic site B. So antigenic site B is one of the major antigenic site uh, uh, in uh, in the antivirus. It's actually a lot. So it's actually a lot of um, antibodies in in the in the um, uh, uh, in the recently circulating uh, uh, in, in in a lot of antibodies in the recent years from human target this uh, antigenic antigenic site B. So um, so again, um, the structural flexibility increases a lot in the receptor binding site and it's mainly affecting the antigenic site B. So this kind of explains why the flu vaccine is not uh, 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 doing so well um, in, uh, in the past uh, uh, 15 years or so. Um, okay, so uh, although um, this mutation is increasing the flexibility of the, of the um, receptor binding site, um, it's actually helping the virus to bind to the avian receptor. So, uh, so uh, um, we co-crystallize the, uh, the, the the adaptive mutant, the P194, with the avian receptor. Um, and then we can see a strong density of the avian receptor. But when we do, uh, when we do the same thing for the um, human version, like not non-egg non adapted version, um, the density is like quite weak. So that means that the uh, egg adaptive mutation is actually helping the virus to bind to the avian type receptor, which makes sense because um, it, it helps the virus to grow in the chicken eggs. Um, at the same time, um, the binding to the human receptor actually weakened a lot um, in the egg adaptive mutant. Um, so yeah, we're only seeing like some weak density uh, for the for the uh, uh, human receptor when, when we were trying to do a complex structure with the egg adaptive mutant. But when we do the same thing for the um, non 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 egg adaptive counterpart, we see a very strong density. Uh, um, so yeah, this is again showing you like, like some structure about physical evidence showing you that egg adaptive mutations are uh, that this particular egg adaptive mutation l 194 p is helping the virus to adapt to the chicken eggs to, to let them grow better because they can bind to the receptor much stronger. Um, but yeah, so this is only part of the story. There are other egg adaptive mutations. Um, so l 194 p are showing showing you the prevalence in different years uh, when uh, 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 so in, in green line, okay? So we, we can also see this G186V mutant. So this G186 mutant in gray line is actually also quite prevalent. Um, so yeah, L194P again in the receptor binding site, G186V is also in the receptor binding site, but in, in the opposite side. Okay, um, so one thing that we uh, discovered is that the G186V uh, mutant, which is represented by uh, this uh, 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 orange uh, node here, um, never really co-occur uh, with uh, 196P mutant. Okay, so each um, node or each uh, uh, oval shape um, in this graph represent uh, one uh, adaptive mutation. So you see L194P is like the most common like you say red, which is highly occur, like which, which, which means it has a very high occurrence. Whereas the G186V uh, is, is orange, it's also quite uh, uh, common. Um, and then uh, uh, um, we also showing an edge between uh, different um, egg adaptive mutation. And if they co-occur, there will be an edge. And if they co-occur like pretty often, then the edge will, will be uh, thicker, okay? Uh, 
And you can see here, there's no edge between one uh, linking between uh, linking the 194p and the G186v. That means that these two egg adaptive mutation they never co-occur, even though they are the most two, the two most common ones. They actually never co-occur. So we do we do a simple experiment. Uh, we put G186v in the virus, um, and then on the x-axis is actually is a TCID50, which is a way to measure how uh, how well the virus grow. Um, so the virus go really well. It go to uh, it grows up to eight log. Um, uh, um, of TCID50. Single mutant, it also grow. G86V, it, it grows pretty well, like wild type like. L194P, it doesn't grow as well because this is where we were using here human cell line to do experiment. Um, so GN, so L194, well, L194, L194P, we know that it doesn't bind to human uh, receptor that well. So this uh, loss in, um, uh, in replication is expected. But what is surprising is that if we put those two mutations together, uh, we cannot really uh, make the virus. So these two mutants together is not compatible. Uh, if you put them together, the virus cannot survive. We do it for two strings, uh, Brisbane 07 and Victoria 11, same observation. Um, so we're trying to understand why um, these two mutations are not compatible. Um, one thing we, we, we look at is uh, we, we try to measure the distance, the height of the receptor binding site um, to understand the effect. Uh, the, the, the effect of the mutation. Um, so uh, in gray, um, those are all the natural string isolated from human, no adaptive mutations. And then this mutant right here, uh, this, this, this particular string right here, it, it carries the L194P uh, mutation. So the height of the receptor binding site drops a lot. So it kind of like the, the L194P, I mean, it's not a lot, but they, it drops a little bit. So it actually squeezed the receptor binding site a little bit. Okay. And then we have, we have this, another mutant, right? That never co-occurred with uh, L194P. And this mutation is called uh, G186V. We talk about that a little bit. And this mutation actually increased the height of the um, uh, binding site. So this is expanding. So this mutation actually have opposite, opposite effect on the binding site. Um, again, we, 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 we solve some crystal structure um, uh, uh, um, just to show that uh, uh, it's, it is indeed, a, indeed the case um, in our hand. And then uh, now we can see L194P uh, in, in orange, and this, uh, this particular mutation, uh, this particular string carry the G186V in uh, blue. Uh, we can see that the helix, the, the position of the helix, uh, which is where the, those two mutations locate, um, actually differ, uh, differ quite a lot, okay? Um, yeah, so uh, L194P, uh, if we use a very uh, 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 low contour, we actually can recover the density of the receptor binding site. But if we uh, put two mutations together, um, the density is, is much, much, much weaker. We don't actually see anything. Actually, I think this sigma is around is 0.5. We don't see any uh, uh, density at all for the helix. So, uh, so if so, let's uh, uh, summarize what we uh, uh, what what this means. Um, so we know that L194P increased the flexibility of the, of the receptor binding site. That prevents the antibody binding, right? Uh, but, it, but the virus can still replicate in X and actually, it's actually helping the virus to replicate in X. Whereas these two mutations, these two mutations, they're both helping the virus to add it, adapt to X. When we put, put them together, uh, it's, it's actually destroying the receptor binding site. Um, the virus cannot uh, replicate anymore. Um, so one interesting thing is, um, this G186V mutation um, actually does not really uh, change um, the antigenicity. So the, our immune system cannot really tell the difference between a wild type and a G86V mutant. So the G86V mutant actually behaves differently than the L194P mutant. Um, so in a minute, I'm gonna talk about how we can actually use it to help uh, vaccine design. But for now, I'm just showing you the data that uh, uh, to, to demonstrate um, how G186, 86 v doesn't really change antigenicity. So um, this time we vaccinate some mice uh, with the wild type, and then we have a booster, um, and then we collect the serum. So in this case here, um, we plot, we're plotting the percentage of wild type binding. So if, it's, if something is 100% wild type binding, that means it's not changing the antigenicity. So as we can see here, G186 v G186V in this graph right here, uh, most of them are like actually 100% wild type binding. So that means it's not actually changing the antigenicity that much. Uh, whereas one L194P, um, again, this is um, uh, consistent with what, with, uh, what we found uh, using uh, human serum. Um, 
the uh, percentage of volatile binding drops a lot. That means that the L194P is changing the antigenicity, but not uh, 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 GE186V. So we, uh, we use the same monoclonal antibody again to test the binding um, to the wild type single mutant, uh, uh, 186 single mutant, and also the 194 single mutant. Um, so this result is consistent with well, what we found in the previous study. Uh, L194P basically just abolished the binding of the, of the antibody, whereas um, G186V, um, the binding of the antibody still binds okay. Uh, it's actually quite similar to the wild type. That means G186V is actually not really changing um, uh, the antigenicity. So our immune system cannot really distinguish uh, the wild type and G186V. Um, so this is actually something good, right? We can actually use G186V um, uh, 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 in our, um, our for uh, making the egg adaptive mutation. Um, so, okay, so this is a, 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 a graphic summary. So we have uh, some uh, H3N2 clinical wild type. We can add the G186V for it to grow really well in eggs. So now we can make the vaccine with G186V and this has good antigenicity. So this, in, so in this way, uh, we are actually not, uh, uh, so we, we can still get a quite decent vaccine. Um, whereas we've, the, the virus can also adapt differently by acquiring L194P, but that way the antigenicity will be really bad. It would completely change um, how uh, 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 the, the body is generating the antibody response. Um, and the antibody response to um, this L194P would not be able to recognize uh, um, the parental virus really well. Um, the good thing is those two um, uh, uh, mutant, those two mutations are not compatible. So if we select a string um, that adapt really well to the eggs and, and uh, using this pathway, the 186 pathway, that will never acquire the mutation, um, the 1894 mutation, which will make the vaccine bad, right? So, so this information can help um, WHO to, uh, um, to select vaccine. So when they select vaccine, um, they should look at the, uh, uh, um, the, the sequence of the virus and make sure it contains the 186, uh, but not the 194. Um, so that the virus can still go really well in eggs and do not really alter the antigenicity that much. Okay, so uh, um, so uh, there are certain several future directions that we are um, uh, that are ongoing, and there, there can be potential projects for um, uh, the math students, um, the math school students here. Uh, one is we are we are we're constantly looking, we we, we continue looking at um, um, compatibility between different egg adaptive mutations, and we try we trying to um, ultimately we trying to use that compatibility. Um, for uh, uh, engineering um, uh, uh, vaccine C stock so that they can grow well in eggs but not altering the antigenicity. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, um, and the other thing we're trying to look at is we're trying to look at the compatibility, compatibility between egg, egg adaptive mutations and natural mutations. So we, have, we, have, we, we would think that um, different isolate uh, have a diff different tendency in picking the pathway of uh, uh, adapting, adapting, adapting in eggs. So um, that's also something that we should consider in uh, picking uh, uh, cyst strain for making a flu vaccine. Um, so yeah, the ultimate goal here is trying to optimize the cyst strain selection for a grown influenza vaccine, which continues to dominate the market share uh, in the seasonal uh, influenza vaccine uh, uh, industry. Okay, so um, uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we're gonna move on to um, Talk about something a little bit more exciting. Um, I mean, at least it's more exciting to me, which is to develop a, a universal influenza vaccine. Um, so seasonal vaccine is good. I mean, it can provide some protect, put, uh, some uh, uh, protection. But as we can see, egg adaptation is a, is a is a problem. So problem associated with seasonal influenza vaccine. Uh, we have low effectiveness, right? So egg, adapt egg adaptive mutation is a problem. We we'll talk about that, um, and vaccine mismatch is a problem. Uh, we also kind of briefly mentioned that because uh, as, as, you, as we can see in, the, in this uh, uh, diagram in the bottom, uh, we have to pick the vaccine strain um, in around, uh, in around uh, February, March, and then we have to do the entire large scale production process uh, and then including some uh, quality check during formulation and shipping, um, dis dis distributing the vaccine to the entire world. Um, so it takes around six to eight, six to eight months. So the, by the time, uh, the flu season start, it may, the, the virus may look 
something that is like very different than uh, what is included in the vaccine. Um, so those two problems together, uh, we will create a problem of uh, low effectiveness. Um, even though there's some other ways of doing it um, to prevent adaptive mutation. So that this people have, people are now exploring the idea of uh, uh, using cell base. And this is, I mean, this is taking off. Uh, is the, the, uh, uh, right now there are around 3% of the market of the seasonal uh, flu market um, is, uh, is using the cell based method. Um, but even though we can avoid the adaptive mutation problem, um, we still subject to this uh, vaccine is smash problem due to the long production cycle. So even though you make the vaccine in, in cells instead of eggs, um, you, you still have the problem of vaccine mismatch, okay? Um, second, it is prone to escape. So all the, all the virus, uh, all the seasonal vaccine um, uh, will trigger the immune response that target the major, major antigenic sites. And the major antigenic sites can, are, are evolving like quite rapidly. So, uh, um, um, so it's actually not ideal to target the major antigenic sites because they can easily escape any immune response that target them. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll address the, uh, how, how COVID pandemic uh, uh, help us accelerate the production cycle at, at the very end, okay? Um, uh, yeah, and, and then, uh, um, um, and then uh, the, the, the other thing is um, the seasonal vaccine cannot really protect us from the synonic, uh, uh, synonic subtypes. Um, so what is synonic subtypes? This is something that I didn't really talk about in the introduction. So this is actually the ecology of influenza virus. Uh, influenza virus has a reservoir in the aquatic birds. So influenza virus, uh, 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 as, 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 uh, as I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, it has many subtypes, like H1, H1N1, H something, N something. Um, and then it, it goes up to like H16 and nine. Um, and uh, this, this numbering uh, keeps uh, evolving. I mean, it, it keeps, keep, keeps expanding when people discover more subtypes. Um, and we can find all of them in aquatic birds. They don't really kill ducks. Um, uh, if you infect uh, ducks by influenza virus, the ducks are just fine because of some, uh, 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 something special about the genomes of the ducks uh, that we are not gonna talk about. But they provide a reservoir for the virus. Just like bats for uh, coronavirus, um, influenza virus, they like to live in aquatic birds and they will spread to some domestic poultry or some other animals, um, including whale, or uh, a seal, um, uh, turkey, horse, and some uh, some other animals, and then we and then it can and can and keep spreading in different animals. Um, so in pan and then the two thousand nine pandemic swine flu, that was where, where the virus in the in the swine um, transmit to human, and then it create the pandemic, right? So that's what happened in in uh, two thousand nine. Um, so right now, so what uh, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, there are two subtypes of influenza A virus, H one N one and X three N two. Uh, being circulating in, a, in the human population. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget about other subtypes because they have the potential of causing pandemic. So those are uh, some of the previous pandemic uh, um, uh, in, uh, in the past, uh, in the past uh, century. Um, um, so one of the uh, notable one is, uh, uh, one of the notable ones uh, is a uh, uh, Spanish flu in 1918. So it caused uh, uh, it in fact it in fact 500 million people and killed uh, 50 million people. So consider the back then the the, the 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 population of the the world is much smaller. That's actually like quite impactful. Um, the amount of people they killed, uh, the, the amount of people that got killed by uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, was much more than um, people who died during the World War One um, during that time. Um, so yeah, so. H1 when one caused a pandemic and the virus just stay in the human population um, and become the seasonal virus. Uh, and then we have a, we have a H2N2 pandemic um, during 1915, 1957, um, and the virus stayed for 10 years and that got replaced by a pandemic uh, in 1968, H3N2. And, the, and this H3N2 virus was quite impressive. They, after the pandemic, they just stay stick around in human population up to now, okay? So all the, basically all the descendant, uh, uh, Basically all, the, basically all the circulating virus, uh, all the seasonal circulating virus, um, uh, influenza virus are the descendant of the uh, H3N2 uh, pandemic or 
for the H1N1 subtype, they are all the descendant of the pandemic, the 2009 pandemic. So we, so this is something that we can relate to what is going on right now. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, the pandemic um, of the COVID-19 may actually become uh, something seasonal and people uh, wouldn't worry that too much about that. But at the same time, we also have other subtypes, H5, 7, 9. Um, uh, uh, those are, uh, those subtypes often uh, cross the species barrier and infect human, and that can create uh, uh, um, some pandemic threat uh, potential uh, and, and may create some potential pandemic in the future. So the current seasonal virus does not allow, uh, uh, does not generate antibody response to protect against those subtypes. Um, so uh, NIAID, um, uh, which is under NIH, um, uh, propose this universal influenza vaccine strategy plan, strategic plan, plan which uh, contain four uh, uh, criteria. Um, the first is that a universal vaccine should protect, should uh, produce, should uh, should be at least seventy five percent effective. So this is actually this is definitely uh, quite far away um, mm -hmm. uh, for the seasonal vaccine. And the second, it needs to protect against group one and group two influenza HA. So it needs to protect different subtypes basically. Um, and it has a durable protection response for one year and should be suitable for all ages. Um, so a lot of people turn to this target called HA stem, um, which is uh, 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 um, uh, quite far away for, for, for the traditional uh, antigenic sites. So this HA stem um, is actually in immunosubdominant, which means that when we get infected by virus, not a lot of antibody response tar are targeting that site. But that HA stem is actually highly conserved. So this makes a very attractive. This makes the HA stem a very attractive target. Um, so the antibodies against the HA stem can often neutralize across many different subtypes. So for example, like these two antibodies that people isolate, CR CR914 um, and NFI6 uh, V3, they can neutralize across all subtypes in influenza A virus. Um, this CR914 is even more impressive more impressive, it can even neutralize uh, 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 influenza B virus. So this is, the ex this is exactly what, um, the this is exactly the types of antibody response we want. Um, and we wanna make a vaccine that can elicit this type of uh, antibodies. So currently there are many um, uh, 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 therapeutic antibodies based on um, the, H the HA stem antibodies and, uh, and there are a lot of clinical trials ongoing. But what we really want is a universal vaccine. So our, 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 our body can constantly pro produce the types of antibody response so that we are protected from any flu. Okay, so people can, uh, people were, um, people have like made uh, some of this um, uh, uh, vaccine design, try to specifically eliciting those uh, 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 um, immune response targeting the XJ stem. Um, but the problem is that um, uh, uh, there are some escape mutants to the HA stem, um, even though it's, it's highly conserved, but something conserved does not mean, like something that is highly conserved does not mean that uh, it is not mutable. Um, so, uh, uh, um, and people have been seeing like some conflicting uh, uh, results. Um, uh, sometimes you can see like very strong escape, sometimes they can see some very, some very weak escape. Um, so one of the, uh, the study that I, I, I did was uh, uh, to look at escape in the X3 mutant, uh, in the X3N2 uh, virus. So we, per, we use this strategy called uh, deep mutational scanning. Um, so the idea is that we can make virus in the cells. Um, we can create a pool of mutant uh, at the DNA level, and we can, um, it's actually everything is in the pool in, the, in a single tube. We have a lot of deep, different mutant in the mix, as a mixture. We can make the virus. Uh, based, uh, based on the mixture of DNA. And, and then we can make a, a, like a huge pool of uh, virus mutant. It can be up to like 10,000 mutant. Um, it it's gonna be in a fast, so this is something bulk. And then we can grow the virus. Um, and then we can just run a deep sequencing of the input and output. Uh, by comparing what is in the input and what is in the output, we can measure the fitness of the virus. Okay, um, so we, uh, this is a very high throughput way of uh, uh, measuring uh, the virus fitness. We can do it with, in the presence of antibody and without antibody. In that way, you can just search in a very comprehensive way uh, and quantify the, uh, uh, the resistant mutation. Um, yeah, so uh, um, uh, yeah, I got a question right here, but I, I'm gonna answer that uh, at the very end. Let me finish this in, a, in a, uh, the slides first. Um, 
Um, so yeah, so I, we use this way to quantify the escape mutant. Uh, when we try to look at the HSM across um, uh, eight residues that are in, in sitting in the center of the HSM, we see a lot of them actually can replicate pretty well. So red is like good fitness, right? So they replicate really well. Um, and we also look at escape mutant. So we, we took the two best antibodies, CR, CR904, which can neutralize basically everything. FI633, it can also neutralize like everything in the, within um, uh, influenza A. Uh, we can see a lot of like purple color, um, which means there are a lot of resistant mutation. Most of them are located at a residue 45. Uh, we are able to validate um, the, the, the finding in a screen. So we create uh, individual mutations one by one. Um, and then when the bar is like going really high, that means they are resistant. Um, so we have some mutants, some mutants that are really impressive, such as this, like this I-45F. Uh, it can basically resist both antibodies at the, at the highest uh, dose. Um, yeah, so this is just a correlation between the various experiment on the y-axis and the x-axis is a screening uh, result. So they, they, they correlate pretty well. Um, yeah, so 45, a lot of resistant mutation. So we've tried to focus on that a little bit. And actually we see some like minor variant uh, in the natural circulating strain at residue 45, uh, including um, L, M, and in actually in uh, subtype, uh, influenza subtype um, H2N2, we see F uh, um, uh, as a major variant. Okay, so uh, we, we pick uh, three of them for further characterization, I45, M, T, and F. Um, and, I, and then when we test the antibody binding, um, the wild type binds really well, but for the mutant, we test different antibodies. Um, they, they don't really uh, bind that well. Uh, as a control, we have a head antibody that binds to the head. The head antibody binds like quite well. That means the protein is folding, actually folding right. Uh, we will refer to solve the structure. Um, and then uh, um, uh, the structure basically is showing us that um, like changing, changing that position 45 actually can uh, create a void in the structure when the when the antibody bind or like it's just it's just clashing with the uh, antibody. Um, those mutants they don't have a fitness cost, um, and then when they when we infect mice they can just kill the mice uh, as effectively as the wild type. Um, and when we try to do this, uh, 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 try to see if the if those mutants can escape the antibody in mice, uh, they can actually escape it. Um, we use a pretty high dose of uh, the antibody CR one one four as a ten milligram per uh, cake. Um, and then wild type, it, like it just protects everything. Even the lowest, the lowest dose, one milligram per cake, um, it, 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 it protects everything. But in those mutants, even at the highest dose, the, the, the virus can, can kill the virus, can, can, can kill the mice. Um, one interesting thing is during this study, we realized that uh, this problem is actually subtype, subtype specific. We did a screen for X3N2 virus. We see a lot of escape. We did a screen again with H1N1 virus. Uh, there are a lot of, actually a lot of greens, not a lot of purples. Green is actually increasing the sensitivity to the antibody. So it's actually doing the opposite thing. And we also did another H1N1 for, eight, for two antibodies, FI6, V3, CR114. The results are quite similar. We don't see a lot of purple. That means um, the virus is actually quite sensitive. It cannot really escape. But for X3N2 virus, we, do, we did it for two strings, Hong 68 and PERF09, which were isolated uh, 40 years apart. Um, the, 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 the observation are quite similar. Um, we see a lot of escape mutant. So this seems to be a subtype dependent issue. Um, yeah, if we look at this graph again, going back to literature, look at this graph again, um, actually a lot of the, uh, the escape where we find strong escape are in uh, X3, 5, 7. Whereas, the weak, whereas, whereas for studies that cannot really find a strong escape mutant, um, they often work, they, they, are, they are actually all of them, they're working on H1N1. So in summary, so strong resistance to the HA stem antibodies are highly prevalent in H3 antivirus, but not in H1N1. Um, and the, those resistance have really, have, doesn't really have a fitness cost. They can grow really well in mice, um, in cell culture, and they can, they can resist uh, antibodies in, 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 in mice. Um, um, the, so the conclusion is that different influenza strengths and subtypes may have a different propensity to escape HA, HA stem antibodies. Um, so even for, for now, uh, it seems like HA, HA stem antibodies can neutralize many subtypes. It is likely that um, uh, we haven't found uh, escape yet in nature, or escape at least is not uh, a, a, a major issue, is that because um, uh, we haven't really do a large scale uh, uh, usage of this type of um, HA stem antibodies as a therapeutics, 
or we haven't really used, uh, we haven't really triggered a lot of uh, HSM antibody response based on some universal vaccine design. Um, so in order for us to move forward, um, something that we have to consider is that uh, uh, if we really want to make a universal vaccine against the stem, uh, we, we should really be careful about uh, um, the escape, the potential escape. Um, so future direction, um, uh, we, uh, we, we will still continue looking at how HSM antibodies can overcome resistance. Um, so even though the virus can escape, maybe there's some way or some antibodies that can actually uh, um, overcome or, or uh, can, can tolerate uh, those type of mutations that we found. Um, and then we also try to search for different uh, a diversity of actually stem antibodies and see if they actually have a, the same escape profiles. Um, yeah, so the goal is trying to make a like, truly, truly universal uh, influenza vaccine. Um, so that we don't have to worry about um, the problem of escape. So yeah, um, so I'm trying to use this couple of slides to end my talk. Uh, in 1945, uh, during uh, the end of Second World War, uh, that's when the egg grown seasonal vaccine was first being used at large scale. Okay, 1945. That's 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 when seasonal vaccine was first used. And right now, 20, 2021, um, we're pretty much doing the same thing. Okay, uh, we we may improve a little bit because uh, we have some other new technology, but egg grown vaccine is still taking over ninety percent of the market share. Um, whereas for COVID nineteen, we are already using like some mRNA vaccine. So this is um, uh, uh, this is this is uh, kind of this is addressing one of the problem in the chat. Um, how the has the COVID nineteen pandemic taught us better to accelerate the production cycle? Yes, mRNA vaccine can, can, can produce in a really uh, short time period, um, uh, and then. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but the problem is with the in influence industry is that uh, the infrastructure of all the egg grown vaccine um, uh, is like is there, um, and there's minimum incentive for the uh, the pharma, the big pharma, to switch to something new, because um, uh, that would require, require uh, some R and D costs and other other, other stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, right now if we're still uh, sticking with uh, egg grown vaccine. The world is st sticking uh, with uh, egg grown vaccine. Um, hopefully in the future we have, we have something different. Um, where uh, the egg grown vaccine, uh, we have a huge problem in, uh, for flu, in flu evolution, such as vaccine mismatch, uh, egg adaptation, and uh, escape. Uh, so we have to update, like constant update. Uh, hopefully we have something in the future that is, we don't have to worry about this influenza evolution problem that much. Okay, so with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, people in my, uh, in, my, in my postdoc lab, uh, some of my collaborators in my uh, postdoc institute at Scripps. Um, um, and, uh, and my collaborator at, at UPenn, uh, Fred Hush, um, Hong Kong University, uh, UT Austin, um, uh, and, and uh, people in my lab um, that, uh, that are helping to push uh, this research direction forward. And, uh, and of course, um, all the funding um, from NIH and Gates Foundation. Okay, thank you. That's, that, that's the end of my talk. I think I'm over by one minute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. Yeah, should, yeah. should I, was, I answer yeah. the question in the chat? I, yeah, there were. I saw uh, from from Brenda. There was a question actually even earlier uh, in the chat. She was oh, asking okay. about the extent of glycosylation changes over time. Uh, I didn't know if you'd seen that. So, oh yeah, I missed that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about um, so these these changes over time and over the course of a particular flu season? What about within an individual previously vaccinated with last year's vaccine? Yeah, so uh, um, I mean, uh, flu evolution is a con continuous process. Um, so usually within a flu season, um, that would some that that would often be because because during the flu season, the, the, you can you can think of the flu population is actually expanding, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when 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 flu when flu activity is low, we only have like one or two flu, right? one or like a few infection going on. But when the flu is, season is is going, uh, the flu population expand. Then oftentimes we we'll discover some uh, new mutations. And of course, glycosylation is something that is uh, uh, associated with new mutations. So that, um, that can happen. And that actually happens before. Um, and then I- Another question. Uh, the cells, yeah. Yep, in the cells. Yeah, so uh, for, the, for the cell, uh, uh, um, uh, where, so in, in, when, when we passage the, 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 the flu in eggs, um, sometimes they will lose some glycosylation. Um, that is related to egg adaptation process. When we pass the virus in cells, um, this loss of glycosylation is not as severe, but if you passage them extensively 
um, we can still see the loss of uh, glycolization. So that means that uh, we still have a selection pressure in the cells for the virus to evolve towards less glycolization, but the selection pressure seems to be uh, weak, uh, much weaker than what we see in eggs. So cell is like making vaccine in cells is definitely much better, mm. but uh, uh, this problem is still there basically. Mm. Yeah. I'm surprised you had mentioned, you know, uh, for a lot of these companies economically, right? The sort of the supply chain, the production lines are, are, are geared for the egg model that, uh, but yet the out, you know, if the outcomes were that much better, I would think it would be worth the investment to switch. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I think there are some uh, uh, marketing, um, like some business people, they, they're trying to project what is happening in the next um, uh, 20 years. They're mm -hmm. foreseeing that in the next 20 years, um, the egg adaptive vaccine will be, um, will become, will be uh, shrinking to around 70% of market share. I mean, based on all the cost model and stuff. So, I mean, 70% is still, uh, yeah. it's still quite a lot. I mean, 20 years dropping from 90% to 70, 70%. That's not a huge improvement, I would say. Hmm. So, yeah. Good point. Yeah. I think those are the main questions in the chat. We can, let's open it up for the, the audience here. Feel free to unmute and ask questions that you, you may have. Uh, Jessica. Well, I, I, I'm trying to understand a little bit more about this. Is there anything that we can do and learn from this that could, that could uh, help us to not just um, vaccinate people, but do some preventative transfer of the virus from say swine or, or poultry to people? Oh, I see. Uh, uh, but that, that would still be um, some sort of vaccination saying right well potentially i don't know i mean you you were talking about having if we could vaccinate the the sources um of the virus i'm just wondering if that that would mm. prevent mutations in the in the human variants oh i see uh, uh yes yeah i mean uh so so one thing is like uh um yeah i'll, I'll address this problem in like twofold one uh, the first thing is uh, 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 the flu virus is actually quite diverse. Um, so if you take a, take um, some virus from uh, um, uh, the animal and inject a human, that would that the chance of having that matching that that the chance of having that matches what is ongoing in the next season is going to be quite low as well. Um, and then and then most of the time the flu season is a uh, uh, the, the flu virus is continuing uh, evolving in human. Um, so it's better to predict uh, uh, the, the evolution of the virus circulating in human uh, uh, in order to find a good strain for the next uh, for, for the vaccine for the next season. Um, but that being said, um, uh, talking about like I mean this this question is kind of also uh, related to like the, the, the synodic uh, 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 the synodic uh, subtype, whereas like we have this H seven H five virus where. The seasonal virus, the seasonal vaccine is actually have no, like none, uh, protective effect on those uh, subtypes. So actually, NIH are like doing all this like clinical trial that they're, they're, they're actually trying to uh, 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 vaccinate people with potential, um, like with virus that have potential to cause pandemic. So they they create this HA from H five and H seven and then uh, vaccinate people, try to trigger some immune response so that. Uh, and see if that can actually protect against some potential pandemic virus. But I think the, the, the more uh, permanent solution would be like making a universal vaccine that would solve like everything, but it will be challenging. I yeah. hope that answers your question. Yeah, it was kind of a, it was kind of a, an obscure question, but thank you. Yes, you helped. I, we're yeah. working. Uh, I, I'd like to meet with you separately and learn a little bit more about this. I'm, I'm just curious. About yeah, that. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so maybe I have a question related to that is, mm -hmm. um, which do you think is, is really more responsible for this, this, the poor vaccine efficiency? Is, is, it, is it really our ability to model or predict what's coming? Or is it the fact that, you know, again, the culture model in the eggs drives all these mutations? Because I would think with, you know, computational power, we should be able to predict, or how good are we at predicting what those mutations may be and to, you know, anticipate those? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so, so I, I can go into like a little bit about, about the prediction. Um, uh, uh, so, um, uh, I mean, our prediction is definitely much better, right? I mean, we have been improving 
just like weather forecast, we have been improving over time. Uh, but we are, we are not there yet to predict a new mutation. What we can, what, I mean, what people can do right now is they can predict like which um, clade of, extinct, of existing virus will expand over time. So everything you are predicting is still based on um, the currently, currently circulating strain. But if you have a mutation, like if, if, if during the vaccine production process or during the flu season, you have a, you have a new mutation that emerged that was not in your training data. Uh, and that, if that mutation actually affecting the antibody response, then that would be a huge issue. So, uh, and, then, and then currently we don't have the power to predict that kind of mutation. I see. Yeah, so um, yeah. Um, uh, but, and, and, then, and, then, and then the second part of your question is like, which problem is causing, is causing a more severe issue, right? Whether it's like the prediction or adaptive mutation. Um, um, I think it really depends on the year. Um, in some years, um, uh, I, think, I think like two years ago, 2018, um, the egg adaptive mutation is like really bad. Uh, it just, uh, I think it was like, it's, it, it, makes the virus, it makes the vaccine like not useful at all. It's like completely, it looks completely different uh, to the circulating virus. I mean, for the immune system, it just cannot, cannot, yeah, it, all the antibody response generating against the vaccine virus, it just cannot really recognize the, uh, uh, um, uh, the circulating string. I mean, some, some part of the antibody response can still do it. I mean, there's like 10% protection. Um, but yeah, it's like really, really bad. So that year was due to uh, uh, um, uh, the adaptive mutation issue. But some, some year it was like vaccine mismatch. So yeah, it really depends. Um, I don't know which one is uh, having a more uh, severe, uh, 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 like which, one, which problem is more uh, uh, severe, but I would say uh, <laughs> both of them are quite severe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. I had a question. Yeah, um, so how, I'm just curious, and we might not have research for this. How how does the mRNA vaccines match up in terms of um, the effectiveness and the you know the mutations? Yeah. So uh, um, so mRNA vaccine uh, of flu. Uh, I think I think Moderna is it Moderna. Yeah, I think Moderna is they they they're trying to. Uh, I might be wrong, but I think it's Moderna. Um, it's trying to do this. Uh, 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 um, like combining the COVID vaccine with uh, flu vaccine using this mRNA vaccine approach. I think that's a good idea. So you can shorten the production time. Um, uh, uh, and everything, and you can avoid that, that mutation. Um, I I haven't really uh, I, I I haven't really looked into um, uh, what's the effectiveness of that, but um, there are some other approach such as recombinant protein vaccine where people actually make the protein, like they they, they produce the protein in uh, insect cells. I mean this this is a, a very common way of making uh, 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 HA protein. So to make the protein in insect cells, so. The, the, the sequence they put in uh, will be the what that will, will exactly be the same as the protein they get. I mean, uh, the, the, the protein sequence they get right from the output. So this part, this issue can avoid any adaptation problem, like no cell culture adaptation, no adaptation process. So um, so this is a really good way uh, to ensure you're getting what you want, um, and the effectiveness of that is actually higher than uh, the seasonal vaccine. I think it's it's quite quite it's higher by. Um, uh, 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 by quite a large margin. So uh, this is showing that uh, um, like some of the newest te newer technology, uh, for example, we can we come in protein vaccine and potentially mRNA vaccine can actually add, improve um, uh, uh, the manufacture uh, the effectiveness of seasonal vaccine. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yep, thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Other questions? You know, I, uh, I, I guess I was listening throughout the talk for AI to come up and mm -hmm. uh, it, it just seems like, uh, you know, with this ability to, to identify patterns and uh, in all this with these mutations, where do you see a role for AI to play in yeah, uh, yeah, that, predictions that's, here? Yeah, I, I'm, uh, yeah I, I have been uh, working with um, uh, uh, some, uh, computer science, some, some faculty in computer science. Um, um, I think the uh, like some of the model is actually doing uh, 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 quite decently. I mean, it's not like perfect. Um, uh, uh, there's still like quite a lot of uh, 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 uncertainty in the model, but like uh, some of the language model, I think I think they're they're doing they're doing quite well. Um, uh, but for AI, I think one of the uh, uh, biggest, I mean, by talking to like uh, faculty in the, in the computer science department, um, the key is to have data, especially high quality data. So if you have a lot of data, then you can train some uh, neural network or like some deep, deep learning model, and then you can make a good prediction. 
And if you have a lot of, a lot of data and a lot of high quality data, then you can do it like really well. Um, so uh, I, I briefly mentioned the, uh, uh, one of the uh, experimental platform that is uh, in the lab is uh, trying to, is that we can measure the replication fitness of tons of inference mutants mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can somehow uh, fit this kind of data um, into some uh, 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 AI model, I think that would definitely help uh, predicting what is upcoming next. I wouldn't say this is going to be an easy task, but I think this will get us a step closer. Yeah. I suppose the challenge is that so much, you know, you, that large volume of data that you need to train the model uh, comes late because it's, or it's ever changing because of the mutations. And so yes. it's, a bit, it's a bit kind of trying to catch up. I didn't yeah. Want to say yeah. Chicken, you know, a bit of chicken and the egg, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, I think for now, we're still trying to catch up with the virus. I mean, we can see in the COVID-19, right? <laughs> we are, we're trying to catch up uh, with the virus evolution. We, we haven't, I mean, we have, human has, hasn't been able to uh, be a, a step ahead of the virus evolution. So um, I guess that would be a, a, um, uh, a major goal for uh, the virus research. And maybe um, it, I think it will be a collaborative effort uh, with um, different fields trying to like actually predict what is the virus uh, is heading. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Other questions from, from the audience? It's really interesting, I think. So timely too, <laughs> as we head into another flu season. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, one thing, vaccine is not, even though sometimes vaccine is not very effective, it is still effective, right? I mean, so <laughs> go yeah. get vaccinated. Yeah, I, I was yeah. I was waiting for that question too, is what, what's your prediction for this flu season, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's really hard to say because like the flu activity has been low um, mm -hmm. for the past year. Uh, we don't know what is, I mean, we don't have much data on the flu evolution in the past year because like people are wearing masks so the, the transmission is low and then um, uh, uh, I, believe, I believe a lot of the surveillance effort uh, went to COVID instead of flu so uh, yeah we don't know what is the flu doing um, so it might surprise us I don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well may maybe as our, our closing question I have to come back to the comment you made about mm. ducks yes and and why they you know do they act as a reservoir or do they just are not affected at all by uh, yes yeah. one of these carriers yeah so they, they they act as a reservoir and then they are not affected by at all i mean it, i mean you can think of the, the same way as like some virus that exists in human that, that it doesn't really affect us um uh, for some like infancy infancy virus it's caused some uh, it's caused some like mild syndrome but it's we never really talk about that because it's it's not a thing pretty much um uh so the same thing for duck, like influenza A virus in ducks, uh, uh, they don't, they don't, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a duck, but uh, I would say they probably don't feel anything. <laughs> they probably don't feel, don't, don't feel much. They just let it circulate around. They don't die. I mean, yeah. yeah what, what can we learn from that? Is it at the genomic level that we- Yeah, really so they, are, they have something called uh, defensin. It's like a, a part of, um, it's like some uh, uh, immune, com like some component of the immune system. It just have a, 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 a uh, a larger, larger uh, repertoire of defense in that somehow can help them uh, counteract the flu, like can help them control the flu in a much better way than uh, um, some other animals. So it's something like built in. I mean, we don't have it. So, <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. yeah, yeah, very good. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, again, I want to thank you very much, Professor Wu. This has been really enlightening um, as we kind of head into this flu season, right, and think about this all the time. I, I do want to point out, uh, Angie put in the chat uh, a link there if people wish to, to uh, submit for CME credit for these, uh, these seminars, that's always available. Uh, so please do that if that's relevant to you. And uh, just really want to, again, express our thanks and uh, have the, the whole group kind of uh, share with me, join with me in expressing our appreciation for you uh, presenting today. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone, all right. thank you for joining us. I uh, wish you all a good weekend, and we'll see you next time. All right, see you. Thank you.